last two inserts regarding COVID-19 have been presented from Reinke's Fontaine, courtesy of some very kind and generous breeders in Maritz Fontaine, Main Chance Farms, Drakenstein and Wilgewors Drift. And today, it is indeed a great honour and a great pleasure to be presenting from Turfontaine, and that is courtesy of Hyper Paint. Johnny Peter, Paul Peter, the whole Peter family have given us the opportunity to present an inside view on what's happening here in South African horse racing without racing actually taking place. We've managed to keep nine training centres COVID-19 free for the past 55 days. That includes Turfontaine, the Val, Rijkiesfontein and all the training centres down in KwaZulu-Natal, in the Eastern Cape, in the Western Cape and indeed the Northern Cape. But today we're going to speak to Hazel Kahir, who's going to give us some insight into what government are thinking. Hopefully she's got a crystal ball that tells us exactly when we are going to be able to resume racing. We're also going to have an opportunity to speak to Muzi Yeni, who suffered a terribly cruel blow in his racing career. Whichever way you look at it, he's been without income for close on six months. We're also going to speak to the racing control executive, Arnold Hyde, who's going to give us some insight into how the race meeting will actually take place behind closed doors. It's a very straightforward procedure. We did it before lockdown and we know we can do it again. We've also had the opportunity to speak to leading trainer Paul Peter. We also spoke to Sipo and Tlapo and Charles and Glovo and Andres and Guiza from the stable of Sean Terry. But let's start off first of all asking Hazel Kahir if perhaps government haven't truly understood the significance of the employment and the heartache that goes along with not racing. That's true. One of the things that we've just discovered is when talking to government, the first thing that pops into their head is the Vodacom Durban July. And you can imagine the crowds that are there. The next thing that comes into their head is betting shops. So we've actually been able to start engaging with dialogue with them and trying to explain that there's more to the industry rather than the big fanfare of the racing events that take place. Granted, they do actually help us bring in the vibe and the excitement of horse racing. But then it is not only about the crowds, it's not only about betting. We're getting to a point where government government is actually listening to us, they're willing and they're actually considering our submissions to them. So do you think that the welfare angle has really got to their hearts now and that they understand the ramifications of actually not racing? Yes, that's correct. Because one of the things that we've just gone back and explained to them that it's not about just taking care of the horse. The horse also provides a livelihood for us. Without the horse, that is a loss of jobs. So with every euthanasia taking place, that is a loss of jobs. And they're now being able to actually understand without the horse, we don't actually have any jobs. There is no livelihood. There is no way for people to make money. You don't have fed mansions. You don't have equine vets coming through to assist. For you and for many of your colleagues, this is not just a job. This is a love of animals. This is a choice that you have made. And obviously it must be very painful if an owner can no longer pay for his horse that he has to say to the trainer, you have to dispose of this horse. It's a terrible thought. It hurts more. When you see an empty box in the yard, you're starting to worry, when is the next horse going to come? If you see a horse going out, you know that is another job loss. So if these horses are not going to be here, what are we going to do with all the people that we've got here involved in racing? We need to try as much as we can to get the government to start racing, to keep these owners happy so that they can be able to pay for these horses. We need these jobs. Without this uh, racing, I don't know what else we can do. I think owners and trainers and people that live in stud farms find themselves with a very, very difficult choice right now. It's not just necessarily about feeding the horses, but it's also trying to feed yourself and your family. Do you feed your employees? And you come to a point where even though there are measures in terms of being able to rehome them, those facilities can only take a certain number of horses. If it's not, it's only just donating them to some farms. But for us, our concern also comes through is how will they be taken care of? So the the welfare aspect is also quite important to us, so it is very heartbreaking that we find ourselves trying to make these choices to say, do we euthanize our horses? If we then don't do that, how are we going to feed them? How are we going to take care of them? Um, so that is a very, very difficult choice currently for owners right now. This particular pandemic that has hit South Africa and the rest of the world maybe couldn't have come at a worse time for you just having got back from uh, an enforced suspension. I'm facing almost six months without uh, 
working, racing. Uh, so it's obviously, like you said to me, it's not a great position to be in. But we still like to focus on the positives. And you know, in all this uncertainty, obviously always having to try find funds for grooms. And uh, obviously most businessmen who fund the sports are uh, unable to obviously work and and pay for these horses. So it makes it very, very difficult. And obviously to Mrs. Slack and the Open Armour daughters, just amazing what they've done for racing, giving us a lifeline for our industry. I think it's a real great silver lining and we can look to some positive. And uh, I think us being able to stay COVID free, I think the government should really come to hand and help us save these horses. The industry gives jobs to a lot of people. So I think it's very important that they look at that, that we are being COVID free and just help the industry get going before it's too late. I got like uh, five people that are depending on me. My uh, two kids, my brother and my wife. So while racing has not been taking place, how has it impacted on your life? These are the difficult times that we're facing now. For now, racing has taken everything that it needed to do. Because we have to start uh, with uh, washing the hands, sanitizing, making sure that everything is clean, the temperatures, uh, monitoring the temperatures. But so far, we've done very well. To try and save the jobs, to uh, look after these uh, beautiful animals, and to try and uh, keep the owners uh, in racing. Otherwise, if these owners, they don't race, they're going to run out of cash, and where are these poor animals going to be? People like Michael de Kock, Jeff Woodruff, Michael Azzi, Sean Terry, guys that we spoke to in our previous two inserts, they're definitely not melodramatic people that overblow the reality of horse euthanasia. Mm. Uh, from a National Horse Racing Authority perspective, has there been an increase in numbers during this terrible time? Andrew, yes there has. There has been an increase in numbers and there will continue to be an increase in numbers unless we can resume racing soonest. Um, I have the uh, unenviable task of liaising with the various bodies um, who are coming to me to ask me what they need to do and how they need to complete horse euthanasia during these trying times. We're trying to save as many horses as we possibly can in terms of rehoming or to um, relax certain conditions where we can to enable owners to hang on a little bit longer because obviously when we, when we do resume racing we need as many horses as we possibly can for the industry. As I said before, the horse doesn't have a voice, they are bred to perform on, on these race courses and we need to look after these horses. It becomes very, very challenging when the economy is in the state that it is and of course when the industry is in the state that it is. You've alluded to the Pumalela going under business rescue uh, in, in the recent past. So we are, we are faced with, with a huge number of challenges at the moment. Do what's right for the horse and try and make sure that, that their needs are catered for because it, it's very, very sad and I mean I'm broken every day when I've got to communicate with the various bodies to make the necessary decisions. It's painful, it really breaks me down and I'm sure it breaks everyone down that needs to be faced with these, these questions and, and to provide answers. But it is a reality, Andrew. I, I can't sugarcoat it, it is a definite reality, yes. Paul, first of all, the industry owes South African trainers a huge debt of gratitude for having kept every training centre coronavirus free and that's through a lot of hard work which is in evidence today. Yes, uh, the racing industry is all pulled together and they've done everything by the book. Uh, the grooms, work riders, jockeys, all arriving in their masks and their sanitizers and they're taking temperatures and everything's done uh, according to the book and uh, I think they've done a sterling job. Now, you know, it's been very tough, and especially with this COVID-19. Uh, we battling trainers are trying hard to help us, even though we're not having racing. It's, it's, it's hard, we're battling, uh, we, we really miss racing, and which means racing, it's, it's the kind of sport that helps us feed our family, and without racing, we're battling a lot. Well, I think that's the biggest problem, is that people are classifying it as a sport, which it is, but it's also a big business. It also sustains up to 750,000 people directly and indirectly. What has been the knock-on effect for you? Have you put in the same amount of work? How's it worked for you? I've been putting the same amount of work. I'm, I'm at, at track every day, every morning, doing hard work. 
uh, but uh, you know the trainers are, are there for us but if this keeps on going without racing we're gonna battle because uh, horses needs to eat they need to be fed they need to be looked after and the meantime the trainers decides they they can't anymore then it's gonna it's gonna take us a big time especially on our families and everything and we hope the government understands and and, and support racing especially um, you know, I've been checking the overseas racing. They racing every day. Uh, when you open a, open the TV, you watch Hong Kong. There's racing, and meantime, we, we never been attacked by COVID-19 too much as it is in overseas. And if we try to race uh, with no spectators, I think that's going to help us a lot. Uh, with everything that we're doing, being at work every single day and trainers having to help us with whatever that they can, it's even harder for them because I've been talking to my boss, he has been battling, you know, he's been looking after horses, owners have been trying to give, give up their horses because obviously there's no racing and with us also, like me, I just had my first born child now and it's way, way difficult for me to look after him with no racing here in South Africa. So it actually gives us a hard knock in our families and, and in our everyday life because now we are trying our best to keep our social distance and put our mask on and put hand sanitizers the way the government wants it to be done. And so far, I think uh, tough hunting and the rest of the other training facilities have been coronavirus free. So that means we are taking the good precautions to, to stay safe and be healthy. But obviously with no racing, I don't think it, cause it, it, it will carry on for long because obviously now trainers are already starting to complain and it's giving a hard knock to them because they've got their families plus the horses to look after. And we've got so much grooms and us work riders, we're battling a lot. I'm sure also jockeys also feeling the knock. So it's not easy. It has changed our, our lives dramatically. And, and with the wages being cut also makes it even harder. Even now we can't even afford to pay our rents and everything. And we can't go complain to anyone because the only good thing that we now to do is to just ride horses. And it's just become a very hard task to live with. Uh. If there was one question I could ask you, anybody that you could make an impassionate plea to open racing, who would it be and what would you say? I would say, Mr. President, please, we've got so many people involved in racing. To try and not to race now, we're going to lose these jobs. What are we going to do with, these, with all these people? Who's going to feed all these people? We don't want to stand in a queue to get money. We need to work for money to be able to feed these people that are depending on us. They all got families and extended families to feed and you know how difficult these times have become. And not to say that they aren't doing it every morning. They are yeah, every day at work, not much different to a race day. So I just can't work out the logic why we can't race behind closed doors.